Chapter 5 The Next Day Don was only faintly creeping through the avenues of the forest when the last wagon, filled with tired merrymakers, drove away from Ripple. The silence which dropped when they had gone was so appalling that Pam turned to Sophie with actual condensation in her eyes. Is it always this deadly quiet after this? She asked, and now it was hard work to keep her voice from quivering. She did not realize that she was worn out with all the excitement she had gone through. You don't think of the quiet when you get used to it, Sophie answered. At least I never think about it. But of course our house is not so quite remote as this. The fact is you are so tired you can hardly stand on your two feet. Suppose you lie down for a little rest before your grandfather comes back, and I will do the cleaning up. As if I should ever dream of letting you work while I take ease, cried Pam in a shocked tone. I'm quite sure that you must be as tired as I am. Only you are made of better stuff, and will not cry about it. Let us do what is necessary as quickly as we can. Then we will just lie down and sleep the worst of it off. I wonder when Grandfather will come back, and what he will say when he finds that I have come. He ought to say how sorry he is that he was not here to give you a welcome, replied Sophie, as she moved to and fro, straightening the furniture, picking up bits of paper, and restoring the room to the condition in which they had found it. The house door stood wide open. Presently they heard the sound of a cow mooing in the barn. There are animals to be fed, and if you are a London girl, you might not know much about milking. Sophie had paused in her work of clearing and was standing still with a frown on her face. She did not know very much about it herself, for in the doctor's household there were always men or boys to do that sort of work. But she was going to help Pam all she could, and if it entailed milking a cow, well, she did not intend to be beaten at the business. She had seen cows milked often enough. The operation looked fairly easy, and she was not afraid of the animals. I know that milk comes from cows and coconuts, and that is about all, said Pam, shrugging her shoulders as she realized the extent of her ignorance. Come, and have your first lesson in milking then. Sophie caught up with the cleanest bucket she could find and tied a towel over her best frock. We may have to feed pigs if there are any in the barn. If I had thought about the livestock, I should certainly have asked one of the menfolk to stay and see us through with the morning chores. As it is, we must just do the best we can until your grandfather comes home again. You never know what you can do until you try, exclaimed Pam, as she too tied a towel over her frock. An imitation of Sophie. The two stepped out into the keen, crisp air of morning and went across the grass, which sparkled like frost to the barn. They were closely followed by the dog. The creature had apparently decided that Pam was one of the family and meant to treat her accordingly. There were pigs and poultry to be fed, there was a cow to be milked and turned into a little padlock, which sloped like a wedge into the forest. There were half a score of sheep in the padlock also, but Sophie said that these would not need feeding, as they were quite able to get their own living. When the chores were all done, Pam went back to the house feeling as if her education had taken a great strides since the previous day, and she envied the ease with which Sophie tackled all the mysteries of milking and feeding. The two were just deciding that now the chores were done, they were free to lie down, and take a rest, when from the open door they caught the sound of horses approaching. A moment later, two men in police uniforms rode up to the front of the house and dismounted. The police, cried Sophie, and her face went as white as her blouse. Courage, Pam, I'm afraid something must have happened to your grandfather. Pam caught her breath in a little sobering gasp and clung to Sophie as the men strode up and dismounted before the door of the house. Is Mr. Purvel at home? demanded the elder of the two, and at the question Pam's courage instantly rose, for of course if the old man had been found injured or dead, the police would not ask if he were at home. Putting Sophie gently in the background, Pam came forward, flushing a little as she looked into the strong, weather-beaten face of the policeman. Her voice was quite steady as she answered, My grandfather is not at home just now, and we do not know when he will be back but we are expecting him at any minute. Is Mr. Purvel your grandfather? I did not know he had any relatives, said the officer, 
and Pam noticed with exceeding dismay that he looked as if he were sorry for her. Mr. Purville has a daughter, my mother, who lives in England, and I have come from there to live with my grandfather and take care of him, she said. Now there was defiance in her tone, for she was telling herself that she did not want this man's pity. Why should people pity her for coming to live with her grandfather? It was horrid. Moreover, it was a slur on his character, and because blood is thicker than any water, every instinct of affection and defense of which Pam was capable railed to champion the old man. The officer nodded. What time did Mr. Provost leave here yesterday? He asked. Then, suddenly recognizing Sophie, who had remained in the background where Pam had thrust her, he said, Good morning, Miss Grinson. I'm afraid we worked the doctor rather hard last night. Was father called out last night? cried Sophie in dismay. Oh, I am sorry for mother, for Don and I were both away. I do hate for her to be left alone like that. What time was father called? Between seven and eight o'clock. He was called to attend to Sam Buckle, whose wife had found him lying near the fence that divides his quarter section from Ripple. He was most fearfully battered, but just alive. I fear there's not much hope in his recovery. He is so badly knocked about. Oh dear, oh dear, how truly dreadful, gasped Sophie and Pam, whose senses were by this time quite abnormally acute, noticed that she turned a glance full of pity upon herself. What time did Mr. Purville leave here yesterday, demanded the officer, turning to Pam once more, and now his voice had a more proprietary ring. I do not know. He was not here when we came last night, she faltered, a chill of dismay creeping over her, and she wondered why Sophie was so distressed and why she so carefully averted her face. What time did you come? asked the officer sharply. This time it was Sophie who answered. It must have been about half an hour, perhaps three quarters after sundown. We came for a surprise party when we were in two wagons coming along the trail when we met Miss Walsh, who in walking here from Hunt's Crossing had lost her way. We took her into our wagon and brought her along with us. We found the house deserted and stayed all night enjoying ourselves. When the others went at dawn, I remained with Miss Walsh, who is a stranger and a city girl, so she would have been hard put to do it alone. That's all we know. Can you remain here with Miss Walsh, Miss Grinson? I will tell your father you are here. Oh yes, I will stay, of course. I cannot leave Miss Walsh alone, exclaimed Sophie, and there was such a thrill in her tone that Pam's face bleached with sudden terror. What was the hidden meaning of this compassion, and what had Sam Buckle's accident to do with her grandfather? But she could not ask the officer. Indeed, she had no chance. Staying only to give a few instructions to Sophie, and saying that he would probably look around that way later in the day, the officer rode away, accompanied by his companion, and the silence settled down again. All desire to sleep seemed to have vanished from both girls. Directly they were alone. Pam turned to Sophie. Why did the man seem to pity me so much? Why should he come here to know where Grandfather is, she demanded. Sophie put her hand up in protest. It may be nothing, of course, but when such things happen, people always jump to conclusions. Your grandfather and Sam Buckle have quarreled about that fence since I was a small girl. As often as Sam has put it up, your grandfather has broken it down. Maybe Sam had been putting the fence up before he was found so badly hurt. A long moment of silence passed. Pam was staring at Sophie with dilated eyes and such a feeling of terror in her heart that she never experienced before. Then finally she found her tongue. Do you mean to tell me, she asked, that you think Grandfather injured that poor man so dreadfully? Sophie put her arms around Pam in protecting wise, and her voice was kind and soothing when she spoke. Dear, she said, Mr. Purville was very likely nowhere near the place when Sam Buckle was found, and when he comes back, he will be able to tell people where he has been. But until then, you have this hard thing to bear, and you will have to be as brave as ever you can. Suppose he never comes back, Pam shuddered violently, and then hid her face in her hands, feeling that the trouble was really more than she could bear. He will surely come back, unless something has happened to him, said Sophie soothingly. Then she bent over Pam's bowed head 
and comforted her as best she could. She succeeded so well that presently Pam suffered herself to be persuaded into lying down. She promptly fell asleep and then lay wrapped in a profound slumber while the hours of the hot sunny noon came and passed. Sophie slept too, but fitfully. There was a sense of responsibility on her that she keep awake and alert. The house door was open and the big dog slumbered on the threshold. The creature seemed to share Sophie's wakefulness, for it kept lifting an easy head. Once or twice it growled, although apparently there was nothing anywhere near to growl at, except the chipmunks darting to and fro, busy in the collection of their winter stores of nuts. Then, far away along the trail, from the westward came the faint beat of horse hooves. Immediately the dog rose to its feet, and stood growling, while Sophie, who had been drifting into a deeper slumber, also rose and rubbed her eyes to get the sleepiness out of them. Pam, she called softly. Pam, dear, there is someone coming. You had better wake up. But Pam was so sound asleep that it was hard work to rouse her. The horseman was very near indeed. The horseman was very near indeed, before she had come to a real understanding of what Sophie was saying. Then she stood for some seconds, swaying to and fro, more asleep than awake. Run and dip your face in the bucket. You will feel better then, urged Sophie. And Pam moved slowly away, found the bucket of water and coarse towel, dipped her face and rubbed it vigorously. At once began to feel better. Why, it's father, Sophie fairly shouted with delight, as a gray-haired man mounted on a powerful black horse rode into the view and lifted his whip in salutation. He rode up to the doorstep, slid from his horse, and Sophie rushed into his arms. The police told me that I should find you here, so I rode around this way, said Dr. Grinson, as he held his daughter with one hand and lifted his hat to Pam with the other. Is this Miss Walsh, of whom I have been hearing? I am very pleased to meet you, but I am real sorry that you should have been pitchforked, as it were, into such a peak of trouble, my dear. I have heard of your mother very often, quite the belle of these parts she was, I should imagine, but more than a bit headstrong. Do you take after her? I don't know, answered Pam, a little dubious, for she thought the doctor was making fun of her. I am not so wise as my mother, and I am always getting into muddles. So did she, according to all the accounts, so doubtless you are a chip off the old block, he said with a laugh. Then he asked if Rock Purville had come back. No, we have seen nothing of him, Pam replied, and Sophie immediately asked how Sam Buckle was. He is very bad indeed, the doctor's tone was curt, a sure sign, as Sophie knew, that there was not much hope. The doctor simply hated having his patients die, and he always behaved as if it were a personal affront when they showed signs of slipping out of life. Has he said anything about about who hurt him? asked Pam. She was determined to know all there was to be known, as she feared they would hide things from her, unless she asked outright. He has not said much of anything that we can understand, except to murmur over and over again, it is his right, it is his right, said the doctor, and Pam suddenly felt a great sinking of heart, for why should the injured man say words like those unless he were living over again the quarrel with his neighbor he is such a fearfully disagreeable man exclaimed sophie as if she read the thought in the heart of pam and would give her comfort if she could i never knew anyone who really liked mr buckle even his own wife admits he is a dreadfully hard man to live with father you will never get your money for attending him he will say that he did not call you himself and so there is no obligation to pay you. That was how he served you the time the tree fell on him and nearly killed him. Didn't you remember it? Some people are that way, said the doctor, but I guess that I shall be no poorer in the long run for doing my duty by my fellow creatures. Would you two like Don to come and stay the night here with you? It is a lonesome place for two girls. We shall not mind, I think put in Sophie hastily, 
She was thinking of her mother and how Mrs. Grinson hated to be left at home at night with the younger children only. Oh no, we shall not mind, cried Pam, who understood perfectly the reason why Sophie did not want Don to come. She, for her own part, was anxious to get used to living alone at Ripple. If her grandfather failed to come back, she would have to do as best she could until her family came out of England to live with her. So it was just as well that she get used to things. We have the dog, and there are two guns in the sitting room. That is one each, and I don't think we need more than that. If you take my advice, you will leave the guns severely alone, broke in the doctor hastily. There was nothing so dangerous as firearms in the hands of people who know nothing about them. We don't want any more tragedies in the neighborhood just now. Keep your mind easy, Dad, said Sophie with a laugh. The guns are here right enough, but so far as I've been able to find, there is not a dust of powder or any shot on the place. Hush, don't talk of it, cried Pam, holding up a finger in warning. All the time, no one knows that we have no ammunition. The guns will serve their purpose. If we pointed the things at any intruder, he would be properly scared, of course, and we should be in no danger, so it would be quite right. You will do, said the doctor heartily, patting Pam on the shoulder, as if she were a little schoolgirl. Now I must go, but I will look along tomorrow and let you know how Sam Buckle is getting on. Have you got enough clothes, Sophie? Would you like Don to bring some over for you this evening? I have nothing but what I have on, and this is my best frock, she answered in a rueful tone, for her best frock had to last a long time, and this was only about the third time of wearing that one. I would spend the time I am here in helping Pam to clean this house. I would spend the time I am here helping Pam to clean this house down. Very needful work, too. But what can one do in a best frock? I will ask your mother to put something in a bag for you. Then Don shall ride over with them, said the doctor, who was in a hurry to mount and ride away, for he was needed in another direction. Sophie, I am haunted by the thought that poor grandfather may have met with an accident somewhere. Out in the woods or the fields, said Pam, when the last echoes of the doctor's horse had died away. Could we not go and look to see if we can find him? We might, but it would be awkward if he might come back while we are away, answered Sophie. We will leave a paper here on the table to say that we have gone to look for him, and we can shut the dog indoors to take care of the place. Pam rummaged a pencil and a piece of paper from her bag, and writing her message, she left it lying in a prominent place on the table with a blue mug standing on the edge of the paper to keep it from being blown away by any draft from the door. The dog was coaxed in and left to guard the place, and then the two set forth on the quest. Sophie had never been at Ripple before. Pam also was a stranger in a sense, and yet she knew so much more of the place from hearsay as to seem quite at home. We will go right around the cleared land first, she said to Sophie, who had naturally fallen into his second place and was following Pam's lead. There does not seem to be much cleared land, Sophie remarked, gazing around at the crowning forest trees. Here and there a little field had been made. Here and there a little field had been made, but even in these great stumps were still standing. We will go around all the fields first, then we will search in the forest. A little sob came up in Pam's throat. As she added, I must find him somehow, the poor lonely old man.